Okay. Let me just check something else. Okay, perfect. Okay, very good. I'm just going to shift this up here. Okay, so evening. Thank you very much for joining us over here and uh, for you know giving up your Saturday or uh, your Friday evening. And uh, today we're going to discuss about to neuter or not to neuter. And there's a question about what's the answer. So there is a lot of different variations, different takes to this. And this is just my personal take onto it. And uh, certainly as we go through, you will just find that it is just me offering my thoughts. And, um, you know, there is not really the reason why there's so many different takes on it, usually because there is more than one answer. <laughs> That's why there's so many different reasons uh, for it. And it's just making an informed decision, really. Just bear with me. Okay, so a little bit about background. Why would you listen to me in the first place? So I'm a vet surgeon. I qualified from the Royal Vet College back in 2004. And um, since then, I've been practicing as a vet surgeon. I've got my own business. Uh, I've started my practice about almost four years ago now in Newton Abbott. And I'm also quite passionate about education, which is why I do presentations like this and uh, I do speak at various events. And now with uh, COVID, we go on to Zoom, which actually allows me to speak to a much wider audience rather than just uh, localized into the uh, area which uh, I work in. Uh, I've also got a book that I've written and published back in um, August uh, last year, and of which at the end of this uh, presentation, I will uh, talk a little bit about it if you're interested. But more importantly, this is all the really, really, really boring bits, really. I'm a bad blah, blah, blah sort of thing. So the whole point is that, you know, I do also have a bit of a sense of humor. This was between jobs <laughs> when I uh, <laughs> cut my hair with the word vet on my head. <laughs> I'm also a pet guardian just like yourself. So that's a little Gabriel whom I rescued. Uh, it was a little hamster that was wa wandering in the streets of Heatherly, brought by two policemen. And uh, it's pretty cool. And you can see that he is a bit of an escape artist. There's already one hole that I covered with a drain cover there. And he's already put another hole uh, beside it. I'm also a father. I was also in the army. I was an infantry officer. Vocational salsa dancer. And the reason why I mention this is because I think uh, it's very easy to classify ourselves as our profession. I think we are more than that. So, you know, you see a vet who is just a vet, you see a dog behavior who is just a dog behavior or an English teacher, just an English teacher. It's very easy to forget who uh, we are. We are so much more than that, really. So it's just to establish, you know, that um, I'm just like yourself. So don't just listen to me. I listen. There's so much that you can teach me as well. So tonight, what are we going to talk about? We are going to talk about, I mean, what is neutering? We just go through a few terminologies of uh, what exactly neutering is. And this, the whole idea of this is just to make you a bit more aware, much more knowledgeable to, um, so when you're speaking with your vet, you can use much more common terms, uh, some terminologies that maybe may sound confusing, uh, but we'll try to break all that cloud tonight. We'll talk a little bit about cat neutering as well. And uh, the focus is more on uh, dog neutering. And just a bit of news where I will discuss uh, the next talk and also the book that I mentioned to you about. So a bit of terminology, a bit of technical terms. So to neuter literally means to remove the sexual organs in both male and female. So it does involve both sexes. It's not just a male or a female. Okay, so that's neuter. So this is a very generic term to say that let's get this particular dog or cat, male or female, devoid of the sexual organs. So in America, they use the word sterilize. So uh, talk about, talking about sterilization, so that refers both to both male and female. Castration is primarily for the male dogs or male cats, male animals only. And usually castration literally means removing the testicles. So it is not vasectomy or anything like that, it's removing a testicle. So it's not, it's not just uh, making them um, 
not able to produce sperm anymore whatsoever, it's actually physically removing the testicle. Yep, so that's castration. Oops. Cryptorchid. Cryptorchid is uh, whereby there's only one testicle. So crypt is a Greek word for hidden. And orchid is testicle. So it literally means hidden testicle. So cryptorchid usually means that when the testicles are supposed to be descended onto the outside the body where you can see them in their scrotum, you can't see them or there's one missing. So it can either be a single cryptorchid whereby there's one testicle missing or bilateral cryptorchid whereby both testicles are missing. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's basically a hidden testicle. Vasectomy is a term that you, use, that you can hear quite often as well because uh, it is uh, done more often in um, humans, in men, so to speak. So vasectomy literally means tying back of the spermatic tube. It, the testicles are still there. You're just tying back the spermatic tube. So the production of testosterone uh, sperm still remains, except that it doesn't get transferred into the penis to go out that way. So yes, you are making them not able to produce any more um, sperm or reproduce, but you're still retaining the testicles. So that's vasectomy, okay? Which is more common, not very commonly done in dogs, I must say. Yeah, you, usually it's, it's a castration, okay? Spay, now we're talking about females. Okay, so the top, the first word neuter, male and female, castration, cryptorchid, vasectomy, all refers to male. Spay talks about female. Okay, so spay, you can see it's spelled S P A Y, sometimes it's spelled S P uh, S P E Y, it doesn't really matter, they're both the same thing. And they usually refer to those two different things ovarohysterectomy or ovarectomy. Okay, ovarohysterectomy or O V H for short, okay, is ovario, removing the ovaries. Hysterect, uh, 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 history, which is the uterus, ectomy to remove. So ovarian hysterectomy, you're removing the ovaries with the uterus all the way down to the cervix. Okay, ovarectomy, on the other hand, is just removing the ovaries. Okay, mm. hello, hello. <laughs> so <laughs> that's just removing the ovaries. Okay, you're you're leaving the uterus still present. Okay. And sometimes, and not in dogs, but in, in human and females, you may, you, you may be much more knowledgeable than myself, hysterectomy is just removing the uterus, leaving the ovaries behind. So all these sort of different terminologies, they do come in place, okay? Because mm -hmm. in, in UK and in many parts of the world as well, spay, you can refer to either ovary hysterectomy or just ovarectomy. Mm -hmm. yep. Okay, so, Right now, going on to cats. Cat castration. Okay, so the pros of cat castration, no more kittens. It also stops spraying because they don't find the need to mark the territory. It also stops wandering and decreases the chance of a road traffic accident. So it's been shown that when they did a survey on all cats that were knocked down by cars or involved in an RTA, a road traffic accident, 80% of them, less than two years of age, entire males. That's a huge amount of statistics. So literally castrating them, especially males, it just actually decreases the chance of them getting killed by cars because they just don't have the need to wander and um, to extend their territory and things like that, or even having the, the how to say, the, the, the one to cross the road when the cars are coming along because they are so full of testosterone, so to speak, okay? The cons to that, the downside to that is uh, actually no more kittens. So it's a one-way uh, thing. You don't go, suddenly I want some kittens from this nice cat that's been castrated. It just doesn't happen anymore. So there is that. And obviously there is also the general anesthetic risk. Okay, any sort of anesthetic is own risk. Okay, so it's just a tit for tat. <laughs> okay, what about cat space? So the pros is no more unwanted kittens, no more calling when in season because uh, some owners have said it can be quite noisy when they start calling when they're in season and certainly uh, reducing the risk of memory tumors because there is no more estrogen um, sort of uh, circulating around in that little cat. The cons to that is certainly as I mentioned before, no more kittens and uh, the generalistic risk as well. It doesn't appear to be too much cons apart from that.
and they can certainly uh, develop all sorts of interesting habits when they are in season. <laughs> So the question is when to do it. So for both male and female in cats, it's usually as soon as possible really because the downside is so little and the pros of not, not wanting them to keep reproducing and having more and more kittens is very high. I mean, a, a, a cat, can you imagine, can produce up to three liters of kittens a year. If you're talking about each litter, is about you know four to five kittens. You're talking about 15 cats every year. So that's a lot of cats, unless you're wanting more cats. We tend to get them done as soon as possible. Um, at least three months of age. So cats protection, they do that at three months of age, um, which may sound very, very young. Uh, but nonetheless, you know, they do that, they do that, that young. And um, certainly their, their objectives are different. They want to rehome it as soon as possible. And they want, uh, so they rather get it done as soon as possible, get it all vaccinated, then rehome. So the whole... The whole idea of it is quite uh, different compared to a, say, a pet. So usually we saw advice at least four to five months of age. If it's a, almost two kilos, that is a, a good enough weight for us to do a cat spay or a cat castrate. Okay, let's come to dogs. It is indeed the dog's bollocks. I thought this photo was quite cute. <laughs> Okay, let's talk about dog castration. What pros are there? So no more unwanted matings. So for obvious reasons, uh, if uh, they are castrated, then they can't have any more babies. If they get accidentally uh, tied with another female, there's uh, no more unwanted matings. It does reduce the risk of prostate issues. We do know the prostate, which we'll talk a little bit more about it in a bit, but it is certainly related to the amount of testosterone that's being produced by the dog um, and uh, taking away the source of, of uh, testosterone certainly can reduce prostate issues. So no more testicle, no more testicular cancer. Okay, so it is really as simple as that because there's no more testicles, you have removing the body part that can cause, can, that can potentially have cancer. Having said that, statistics have shown that uh, about 2% of testicles will actually develop testicular cancer. So yes, there is testicle cancer, uh, but not all dogs that have testicles will have testicle cancer, only 2%. Okay? So the question is, um, do you want to risk at 2% or is it actually even a valid reason for pros considering it's only 2%? Elimination of unwanted behavior influence of male hormones when they are humping too much, they are being aggressive occasionally. Uh, they are spraying all, all over the place, marking the territory, and all, this, all that can be quite unacceptable behavior in a household. Um, you can't have the dog humping everybody, including child, children, <laughs> and you can't have the dog spraying all over the place, including your couch and your living room, and certainly aggression due to a, a surge in hormones. Uh, has been quite well documented as well, and we, we are obviously wanting to sort of uh, prevent that as well. What about the cons? What are the downsides of dog castration? No more breeding. So same again, one-way ticket. You can't get, suddenly go two, three years of age and say, actually, you're a very, very good dog. Let's get a litter off you. It doesn't work that way. No more testicles, no more sperm, no more babies. The general aesthetic as well. Question about coat change, okay, because certainly in, uh, what we find is that in longer coats like Spaniels, Afghan Hounds, um, they are part of their skin, part of their hair coat is also dependent on the male testosterone. And certainly without that, uh, some, some customers, they have uh, some owners, they have uh, described it to be a little bit more fluffy. And uh, certainly if they're going to be showing them at crafts, that may cause an issue because it does have a different coat change. Uh, makes aggression worse. So this comes from the idea that testosterone builds confidence. If you remove the source of confidence and they become more nervous and their reaction to nervousness is unfortunately not being shy but actually being aggressive, then taking away the source of testosterone can actually make them more aggressive. Does it make sense? Yeah. So, so those are the potential cons of it. Cryptorchid, okay, so talking a little bit more about this hidden testicle syndrome. It can be single or bilateral, okay, so either one side or two sides. There is this particular, uh, there's this particular other thing called 
uh, monokid. Monokid means just one testicle, i.e. the dog is actually born with one testicle only. Okay, so that's what we call a monokid. True monokid is very, very rare. Very, very rare. Usually it is a single cryptokid that the other testicle has just not been found. So true monokid is very, is very, very rare. So uh, I personally, I, I've not seen one before, uh, although it's been documented. Whenever I see a single cryptokid, I will always look for the second one and invariably you'll find it. Okay, um, and uh, in even rarer cases, they're born without testicles. That is super rare. Okay, and uh, sometimes it's intersex, whereby it's like a, a part female, part male. But even for those animals, they've got both sexual organs, not none, so to speak. Yep. So, just a little note, just a sidetrack. So, undescended testicles, they're more prone to develop in the tumor. So, the reason why, one big reason why the testicles in mammals are usually found outside the the body i.e in men in dogs in cats in a lot of mammals that you know of the testicles actually found outside is because for spermatogenesis to occur the uh, production of sperm you actually need a cooler temperature not the body temperature you need two or three degrees less than the core body temperature so the, the core body temperature is about say th 37 degrees plus minus you know one um, for spermatogenesis to occur, it has to be about 35, 36 degrees, which is why it is outside the body. And in very, very uh, specific mammals like whales, they're inside the body for various reasons. Uh, but usually mammals are outside because of that's needed. So what happens when the testicles is inside the body is that first of all, not only sp uh, spermatogenesis does not occur, the higher temperature actually makes it more prone to a tumor because it's just an abnormal environment for the cells to grow. That's why they're more prone to tumor. So push come to shove, if you have a single single cryptocid, okay, and there are cases, not that I agree, but there are cases to say that, okay, I want to breed from this dog, okay, we would highly still advise the one that's hidden to be removed, whereas the single testicles that's outside the dog can still produce sperm and still breed from it. Okay, the reason why I say this, uh, this is quite controversial is because we tend to want to breed from genetically good dogs, so to speak. Okay, which also include the fact of the matter is that if this dog is this displaying cryptokid, out of all the other dogs that do not display the cryptokid, should I be breeding from this dog in the first place? But, um, you know, to, to push the envelope, they say that I really want this line, then yes, you still advise the hidden testicles to be removed because it's going to turn a tumor. And, and that is, is, is definite, it's not guesswork. It's, I, well, in my experience, pretty much 99% of the time, the one that's hidden, if you leave over there, over time, you will just get, become a tumor. Yeah. So just to give us a bit of anatomy. So as you can see to your left, that is where the front of the dog is, to your right where the tail is. And you can see where the two little kidneys, which is just on top below the back, with two little ureters or two little strings look like spaghetti leading down to the bladder okay then you can see where the usual testicles is usually uh positioned then the position of retained testicles and you can see the inguinal canal the little white color track okay so usually there are two places of which the testicle can be retained one is in the abdomen where you can see the position of the retained testicle just behind the kidneys uh, or actually in the ingu in the inguinal canal so th those two places so in the inguinal canal, it's fairly straightforward to get to because it's still quite superficial. Whereas in the abdomen, it is actually going into the abdomen to look for it. So it's a whole different ballgame. So, so it's, if you're going to ask your vet how much it is or what does it take to remove a retained testicle, the question is, where is it? Is it in the inguinal canal? That's fairly straightforward. Or is it in the abdomen? That literally means going into the tummy and look for it. So even though they're both cryptokids and retained, um, the the solution can be quite different depending on the location. So if you can take a look, the left scrotum, the left testicle is in the scrotum, okay? And the penis is the one pointing downwards. And you can see the right testicle in the inguinal canal, just a little blip over there, okay? And due to anatomy, and this is also an interesting thing, due to um, embryology, how the cells are formed in the first place, usually it is a right testicle that's gonna be retained because the left usually comes on first. The question is, does the right follow? <laughs> and sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. So, but usually the left side is okay. If you're gonna bi get bilateral, obviously both are, both are gone and they can either be both in the inguinal canal 
or one in the inguinal canal or both in the abdomen. But usually if there's only one, it's the right testicle that you're going to look for. Okay, so in this case, it's fairly straightforward because it's in the inguinal canal. Okay, so looking at this, okay, so this is quite interesting. So you can see that, so let's start from the bottom, the pink color line over there. That is where the normal castration site is taking place, okay? Um, presumably to remove the, last, the left testicles that's been descended, that's fairly straightforward, okay? Then the right is missing, so they probably would have found or they felt something round in the inguinal canal and they have made an incision, as you can see where the yellow, yellow line is and they obviously did not find it, okay, or they felt that whatever that was was just a fat or something like that, that wasn't a testicle, and hence they went up into the abdomen to make the large incision to look for the other testicle which they found in the end, okay? So some people may look at this and criticize or comment to say that, how did the vet not know, how did he mistake it? So very easily, really, because if I were to feel something round, at the yellow color inguinal canal area, I would presume that is a testicle undeproven otherwise because I wouldn't be going straight into the abdomen. <laughs> so so that, is, that is why it could have happened. So, you know, it's a, so, 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 some people, they just don't really understand, but it's just explain to you. If you see something like this, or if your friends tell you that something like that happened, this is the usual approach really, unless the vet is very confident, I cannot feel anything in the inguinal canal, then I go into the tummy. Okay, because as you can appreciate, the whole tummy is a whole different ball game. Look at the size of the pink color line of the normal castration site. And look at the size of the yellow color line of the one presumably is an in inguinal canal. Then you look at the size of the white color line. Once you go to the abdomen, it's always a whole different ball game. Okay? One way to counteract this or one way to address this is to go by keyhole surgery. Okay? So keyhole is putting a camera so you can see on the right side, okay, there's a, there's a little port, the silver port with the little lines like a screwdriver going into the belly. And you can see from the back over there's a black color, there's a black color tube going straight into it. And there's a camera, okay. The camera will allow you to see what's happening inside there without making a big incision, okay. And you can see that they've located where the testicle is and they made a little incision on top to pull the testicle off from the top and remove the testicle as normal, okay. And this is what they can see in keyhole surgery. So there are two ways to address abdominal uh, retained testicle. One is the normal old-fashioned x lab way, big incision, open up, see what's happening inside there. Uh, the other one is the more elegant way, but more uh, so sophisticated, probably more expensive because of the equipment use of using keyhole surgery. This is what you see over there. And you can remove it from the top because you see exactly where the testicle is in the entire abdomen. Okay, what about prostate disease? So we discussed that how castration can certainly aid prostatic disease. So the most common uh, condition that entire dogs will get is this thing called a benign prostate hypertrophy, or BPH for short. So as the name suggests, benign means uh, harmless, or more importantly, it doesn't spread. Um, prostate is a prostate. Hypertrophy means uh, increase in size. Okay, and this is directly influenced by the testosterone production increase in size over there. And sometimes, unfortunately, you can get prostate cancer. Okay, so it's not benign, it's malignant. Uh, so just to be very, very clear about the terms malignant and benign, benign literally means harmless, although that's not exactly the case. Okay, in the sort of tumor cancer terms, benign means does not spread. It's just local. Whereas malignant means having the ability to spread either locally or to distant places, okay? So looking at the uh, prostate, just giving us an idea of anatomy. So same again, starting from the top, you see the kidneys, okay? The two little spaghetti is coming down, is the ureter leading to the big bladder. And after that, the bladder is the bit that collects all the urine. And after that, it releases into the penis to be expelled into the outside world as a as usual. Just after the bladder, before the penis, is the prostate. Okay, so that is where the location is. Okay, so it, the bladder, the urine runs through the prostate. Okay, and in fact, the purpose of the prostate, as you can see, is produce some of the fluids found in semen, is to protect the sperm. Okay, so the prostate does produces secretion, fluid, and uh, 
uh, that comes out of the penis to protect the sperm. So it's almost like uh, the bathing the sperm, so to speak. Okay, but that is where the location is. The reason why that is important is because once you see prostate issues, the position of it is quite relevant. So in this case, the first arrow that is lower down, uh, closer to the left side, so to speak, that is where the bladder is. Okay, the right side is the prostate, which is much bigger. So when your prostate is enlarged, you can see it pushes up into the colon. Okay, so the colon is where the large intestine is, where the poop comes out. So the prostate pushes up into the colon, making that tunnel so much smaller. You can see from the big colon, then it squeezes a small tunnel. So when, when the usual history for that is the dog is straining to poop or produces ribbon-like poo because it's flattened before it comes out, okay? Because it can't get any bigger due to the enlargement of the prostate. And that's where no, we know that there probably is an enlargement of the prostate. Your vet may stick the finger, disgustingly, or with gloves, <laughs> through the backside to feel for the prostate. Okay, you can feel the prostate hugely, then we know that there's an enlargement for it. If you can feel the prostate but seems normal size and the gap, of the colon seems to be pretty good, then good. There's no prostate enlargement. So that's also a fairly uh, sort of a subjective gauge. But yeah, so that's what we're talking about. So when we're doing sort of uh, ultrasound, you can also see that. So just to remind us of ultrasound, ultrasound cannot go through air or bone. Fluid is black. Um, and the rest are all 50 shades of grey. <laughs> okay, So you can see that there is actually the prostate over there. There's fluids. There's fluid measured. There's little pockets of fluid in the prostate itself, which shouldn't be there already. Okay, so prostate disease, as you can see, the normal prostate, the colon is on top. With the prosthetic enlargement, it pushes up into the colon. Just to give you a bit more diagrammatic view, okay? And a lot of prostate issues, uh, prostate cancer, is this particular one called uh, uh, the sort of adenocarcinoma, and one of the characteristics of carcinomas is that it produces calcium. So calcium can be seen on x-rays because it is like a stone, just like the bones, which is why you see a circular bit over there. If we see calcified structures like this, that's probably the prostate that has uh, not been very healthy, so to speak. Okay. Other things to look is spread to the chest. Okay, as you can see, all those little bubble-like things in the chest shouldn't be there. So the chest should, you, you should see a nice big heart right in the middle, and it should be black because it should be air. So once you see all those sort of little bubbles, those is cancer spread, okay? And coupled together with a prostate issue, this, if we see this, we know that it's spread already. Another location where it spreads is up in the spine. Okay, up in the spine whereby there's new bone formation over there. Uh, do not mistake that for spondylosis. That's quite different. Okay, and sometimes you can see the bone sort of being eaten away as well because for whatever reason, that is where the prostate cancer spread as well. So these are all the common places that we look for for spread. As you can see, okay, with all the arrows over here. So the big arrow uh, with the little tail at the bottom right, that's a prostate, is enlarged. Okay, and you can also see that the little arrowheads on top is just pointing the eating of the bone. So we know that this particular prostate disease has spread. So just for example, this is what it would look like under the microscope. Um, just, just, for, just to remind us, cells 101, all cells should have one nucleus only. So you have multiple nucleus in one cell, that's a cancer cell, there's no two ways about it. Okay, so that's a classic carcinoma. So all these cells are all not very healthy looking at all. Okay, that's prostate. Testicular tumors, what do they look like? And what sort of forms are they? So there's Leydig interstitial cell tumor, which is most benign. There, is, there are also seminomas. And there's also Sertoli cell tumor, which is also most malignant. So just to remind ourselves, benign means the likelihood of spread is much less. Malignant means the likelihood of spread is very high. So that's what they look like. And you can see that it is, uh, yep, so one big, one small, classic. 
So that, is all, that should also form a fairly standard check of any entire dogs that's presented to a vet regardless of age. They should be feeling the testicles to make sure that they're both the same size and not in pain and doesn't feel abnormal. So that's not unusual at all. Yep. And you can see these are two, the, well, castration really. And you can see obviously one is, um, one, one, one is much bigger than the other because of the tumor. Hey, so dog castration. What exactly do you mean by that? Okay, so there is an open or closed castration. They're both, they both involve removing of testicles. The open castration involves opening into the tunic, whereas the closed castration does not. There really isn't a better or worse way of doing it. It's just depending on what has been taught in college. They're both approved methods and depending on the own vet surgeon's um, uh, preference really. Like for example, I was taught the open castration. However, when I started working, when I started seeing practice, I was seeing a lot of closed castration. And personally, I prefer closed castration because I find that it is uh, quicker and uh, doesn't bleed as much. But my fellow uh, colleagues who prefer open castration would say exactly the same thing. <laughs> so it just depends on preference. There's also chemical castration. So you may have heard of this particular implant called suprilorin. And that is an implant that is, uh, it's almost like a huge microchip. It's like a little rice grain that can implant into the, uh, the, the dog. And it actually um, chemically castrates. You can see the size of the testicles actually going down. And um, the production of sperm is reduced or totally eliminated after a specific time. Uh, there are two sizes out there. One does six months, one does 12 months. So, uh, and what happens after that is that when the six months or 12 months plus minus few weeks, it's not exact science, this sort of thing. Uh, whereas of the, the function of the testicles does come back, it's up doing sperm again. So it is a, it's a temporary castration. Okay, so it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, you know, it's chemical castration because you're just adding a chemical inside there. So the question is when to castrate. So this is also a big question. When to castrate or more importantly, should you castrate? Okay, so this is also entirely up to preference because of as long as we are always wanting to make informed decisions, you want to know the pros and cons of each approach. Number one, whether to castrate or not. And number two, when to castrate, as long as you're quite clear with the options that you have and why you do what, you know, there's no right or wrong answer to this really, okay? So some customers, some owners, they may not want to castrate because they feel that the dog is quite well balanced and um, castrating would just change the behavior, which is, can also sometimes happen. Um, or they like the whole idea of, you know, my dog is entire, it should be entire, and we shouldn't be castrating dogs in the first place anyway. And if the dog is quite well balanced, does not show any unwanted behavior, it's growing quite nicely, um, it's not aggressive, it's not sand marking, it's not humping everything in sight. Um, and the risk of testicular tumor is 2%. So some guardians, they may wish to keep it intact, especially when they also take on the risk of uh, prostate issues. They know that, okay, if it happens in future, then maybe we talk about castration then, but until it develops that, they want to keep it intact. And that is entirely normal. Um, in my experience, I've seen entire dogs, 15, 16 years old, die of natural other causes. So it doesn't necessarily immediately say that, okay, they will get prostate cancer, they will get prostate issues, they will get testicular tumors and things like that. So uh, the percentage is quite low, really. Okay. And for, for those that choose to castrate, so it depends, it really depends. If they are say, for example, six months of age, okay, they're huge. Okay, so just bear in mind that testosterone also help with, with growth. Okay, so if you want your dog to grow bigger, you need more testosterone, so you don't want to castrate too early. Okay, it does help with growth. So at six months of age, say it's huge, and it is aggressive, and it is humping everything inside, it's sand marking everything, and it's just really driving everybody crazy. Um, and they may want to talk about castration. So that would make sense, okay? Or for whatever reason, they want it to be castrated anyway, and they are quite happy that at six months of age, it is big enough, it is, uh, uh, they just want to be castrated. So that's fine, six months of age, okay? 
if they wanted to be castrated, but uh, they wanted to grow a bit more, then we can live it a little bit longer, maybe 10 months of age, whereby, you know, at six months of age, it's still quite small, it's not humping anything, it's not aggressive, uh, it's not sand marking, they want to live it a little bit longer. So yeah, we can live it a little longer at 10 months of age, and we do it then, okay? So why 10 months? So the rationale behind, and same again, this is just sort of, a, this is just preference, and this is just a guidance, this is not exact science, every single dog should be seen in its own individual state, okay? The reason why I say this is because we know that uh, if it's over one year of age, if you're wanting to castrate because it's showing unwanted behavior, it may become a learned behavior and it's no longer hormonal. So if, say, a two-year-old dog, somebody comes in to say that uh, it's humping everything, uh, it's getting aggressive as well, it's sand marking, I wanted to castrate because that will solve the problem, I'll be the first to say that, um, okay, yeah, I'm happy to castrate, but it may not solve the problem because if it's a learned behavior, then castration may not help because it's no longer a hormonal-based behavior. It's a learned behavior, okay? Which is why we talk about if you want to castrate if, uh, and, and you want to live it longer so it can grow, but not too long, then we talk about 10 months of age before it becomes one year old. Anything more than that, we just say that it may help. I'm not saying it won't, but it may not, okay? So that is uh, the idea behind it. And for those uh, customers who go, or those owners who went that say that I do not want to castrate until it gets a problem, then fair enough. You know, I've, uh, it's not unusual for me to see an eight-year-old, nine-year-old dog that has developed benign prosthetic hypertrophy because it's not castrated and it's just one of those luck of draw. And we do the castration then and the prostate goes on in size because we remove the source of testosterone and everything is okay again and life goes on with a castrated dog at eight years of age rather than eight months of age. So yeah, so that, that one, not too much. For personally, for me, I don't push castration as much because the diseases I see with uncastrated dogs certainly is not as profound as it would be. If I were to see every single one having issues, then yes, I'll be pushing that a bit more. But the reality is that uh, I see plenty of older, entire males that have no issue whatsoever, uh, no issues whatsoever so so be it well done the more contentious topic bitch spay okay the pros so no more unwanted litters for obvious reasons uh, it does reduce the risk of memory tumors because we do know that the memory tumor um, the estrogen is the, so the, the cycling of estrogen does increase the risk of memory tumors and certainly no risk of pyometra. Pyometra means infected womb. There will be some photographs in a bit, but we understand it's about 20%. So one in five dogs, one in five entire female dogs do get pyometra and pyometra is quite a horrible disease uh, condition to get. And the point being is that at a point of time, usually, not all the time, usually depending from vet to vet and what the owner wants, the method of um, treatment is to spay them anyway. But the difference is that the spay is made, is made much harder, the anesthetic may be compromised, and there may be organ dysfunction as well due to pyometra. So it's just a more risky spay. And because of that, usually apart from the risk involved, the cost is usually higher as well. So the cons of a bitch spay, it's a uh, general anesthetic. Um, no more puppies, so same again. Can't be like three years old and say, that, oh, I want a puppy off this bitch that's been spayed. It's a one-way ticket. It does increase the risk of urinary incontinence because we do know that the, for the bladder, where the sphincter is to hold the bladder in place, um, there is estrogen um, connection to that, whereby estrogen is needed to actually keep the bladder tight. So if you remove the source of estrogen for, uh, from the ovaries, the bladder can't keep as tight as it it usually does, and hence there'll be leaking of urinary incontinence. It, people have said that, you know, it usually it happens much, much older when they're seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years old, so to speak. I certainly have seen urinary incontinence as early as six months after the spay, when they are about sort of one year of age. So it's certainly, I wouldn't say that it is a uh, age uh, deposition, although yes, it's more commonly occurring in older animals. And the question would be, which is easier to manage? Cancer, pyometra, or urinary incontinence. So it's a, uh, you gotta pick something really. Uh, coat change, similar to the dog. So removing of the hormones, the sexual hormones, can certainly cause the coat to be more fluffy. Uh, it doesn't necessarily, in my personal experience, I've not seen skin issues. So very different. 
it's not as though they get skin infection or things like that. It's more of a code change. So it's almost cosmetic rather than uh, medical. <clears throat> Rottweiler, large breed dogs and other breed uh, can also predispose bone cancer, uh, which is also quite interesting. So fundamentally, it's quite well publicized in the Rottweiler breed, whereby if they spay before three years of age, the chance of osteosarcoma, bone cancer, is much higher. Uh, and there's, a, there's quite a lot of good papers supporting that. For large breed dogs like Great Danes and much larger breed like mountain sheep dogs, the argument is that it takes you know, a good 18 months to two years or even arguably three years for them to be fully grown and for the long bones to fully form. So if we are spaying them before the long bones are fully formed, before the growth plate has closed, um, there is a link to saying that, okay, the growth plate haven't closed yet, you've spayed them, it's lack of the female hormone, so to speak, is potentially leading to more um, issues with that, including osteosarcoma and bone cancer. There we go. So there's a lot of uh, phrase around spaded and things like that, which is uh, it's quite interesting. There's no such word in the medical profession if it's just spayed or not. Uh, and a spay is exclusive for female dogs or cats, not male dogs. So a lot of people, they make a mistake of saying, my male dog has been spayed. It's uh, not, it's castrated or neutered. That's just a little point over there. Okay, so what do memories tumor look like? Just a bit like that, really. So it's fairly obvious. And as like I said, a, the circulating, a circulating hormones does predispose them to memory tumors. That is actually not a testicle, although it looks like one. It is a caudal memory gland that is enlarged. And the thing in memory tumors is that it's a 50-50. So 50% of them are benign, 50% of them are malignant. And there's also a small group that's mixed. So it's mixed between benign and malignant. So Memory tumors, as you can appreciate, if they are benign, well, it just looks horrible. We can remove it. Okay, it does, it does involve removing the whole memory gland. And sometimes we, your vet may do what we call a memory strip. They strip the entire left side or right side. Okay, and sometimes if you're unfortunate, which is not unusual as well because they're all connected. So you can get memory tumors in multiple nipples on both sides. So they may have to do what we call a bilateral memory strip, whereby they strip one side first, then they close it up. They'll probably wait for a few weeks before doing the second side, because if not, you're just asking for trouble. There's just too much surgical uh, wound over there. Um, certainly for those that have spread, your vet would also, so for those that can spread your vet before they do any surgery, they'll also be advising chest x-rays and ultrasound to make sure it's not spread to the chest. And the whole idea of it is that if it's spread to the chest, what's the point of removing this tumor over here? So some owners may not want that. You can see some memory tumors, unfortunately, they can ulcerate, okay? So it is not just a lump. They actually get infected, ulcerated. It can cause pain and infection. And the dog bites into it, makes it even more messy, so to speak. So sometimes it's not as uh, clear cut as it is. Pyometra. So I've mentioned that earlier on. So it's uh, talking about infected womb. So you can see the difference between a healthy spade womb, okay, whereby you have your ovaries, you have your... Uh, womb and your cervix over there, then you get an infected womb whereby it's like a pyometra, it's just two bags of pus inside there. So it can be quite dramatic. Uh, I've removed a sort of from a 20, 20, 25 kilo Springer Spaniel, quite a big one, okay, about three kilos of pus, three kilos of which was pus from there, so that's quite dramatic. And for Rottweiler, I've removed about six kilos before, so it does get quite dramatic, okay, and you can see the ovaries are quite small over there on the right side. And the womb is just huge, just full of pus. And usually, usually typically happens anywhere between sort of uh, three weeks to two months after the season. And uh, the classic um, signs would be the dog is drinking more than usual, is a bit lethargic, anything that's not right really of that female bitch um, that can be the clinical signs of pyometrose. Pyometra can happen in two different ways. One is open and close. Open means the cervix is open, whereby the pus is actually coming out from the vagina and you can the, the owner actually reports pus dripping, okay? And as disgusting as that sounds, that's actually the better one because at least the pus is out of the dog. Whereas a closed pyometra is when the cervix is completely shut 
any pus that's being produced is just being inside the womb. It just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And certainly, I've personally not seen it myself, but I've heard reports of the womb bursting in the abdomen because of too much pus. And there's a whole different ball game. It becomes a peritonitis, not just an infected womb. Okay, And the thing with that is that sometimes the pus can push back onto the bladder and causing kidney issues as well. Okay, So it's not uncommon for pyometra to have concurrent kidney damage, whether it's transient or permanent remains to be seen, and which is also why I say that the, when we spay, the anesthetic may be much more compromised if there is kidney damage, you can put on antibiotics, you can put on fluids. So yes, it is a spay, but it's a whole different spay compared to a normal spay. Yep, so that's pyometra. And I have to say, in my experience, I've seen enough pyometras to say that if you're not wanting to breed, I will be highly, highly advising to spay the bitch because it's not like the dog can straight. Like I said, I've seen plenty of old dogs living up to 14, 15, 16, 17 uh, and die of normal causes that are entire. But female bitches, invariably, they tend to get pyometra or memory tumors. So it's not very, very common for me to see uh, much, much older female bitches. I'm sure there are, but I'm just saying that comparatively to the male, it's not very, very common at all. You can see this bad boy here. Oh, that's all pus. Those are not puppies. So uh, yeah, that's all pus. <laughs> you can see that. That is still a dog. That's not a horse. <laughs> I've done one similar to that before. <laughs> so it is a... Horrible. And you can see the scalpel blade over there is every gradation is one cm. So I mean this is this easily three to four kilos of pus. And opening up inside, that's pus. So that's a pyometra. Just before dinner. Excellent. <laughs> okay, beach spay. What exactly is involved? So there's open space. So that's the one that most people know about. It is an open space uh, whereby there's a large incision being made. Uh, to remove a, the ovaries and uh, uterus. Keyhole spay is a much more elegant technique, and that's uh, one which I've been doing for the past five, six years. And since I went there, I never looked back. I, like, I personally do not do open space anymore just because it's a no brainer. Just for example, the keyhole spay, instead of one 15 to 20 centimeter incision site, you get two five millimeter holes, okay? And the sort of report that we get from owners is 98% of owners describe the next day as though nothing has happened. That sort of recovery with no, with no extra pain relief. I've stopped giving pain relief to go home with because they keep returning it back to me two days later. They said, we don't need it. The dog is just going all, just happy, so to speak. So um, Kyo Spay for me is a no brainer really. It's just much, in terms of patient welfare, it's just so much better. The recovery is so much better. In terms of customer satisfaction, it's so much better as well. In terms from the surgeon as well, it is certainly much more elegant than me trying to break ligaments and the bleeding is all much, much more well controlled. So another big question, when to spay? So like I said, for dogs, we ask about, for males, we ask about whether to, whether to castrate or not. For me personally, and this is just my personal um, opinion is uh, definitely females spay. The only reason why I wouldn't want to spay is if I want to breed from her and even then after I breed, I'll spay after that because of the incidence of pyometra and memory tumor. The question is when to spay. So this is so much more contentious. So is there actually an optimal spay time? It is really, really individual and as long as and what I want to relay across or to help yourself is just making yourself a bit more informed that when you make a decision, you know why you're making it and you understand the pros and cons because there's no right timing, which is why there's so many. If we spay before the first season, we know there's 98% chance of not getting memory tumors. After the first season, 70% chance of not getting memory tumors. And after the second season, 40% chance. So it drops quite fast. Okay, so after second season, we're talking about maybe one and a half, two years of age, so to speak. So when we spay after that, we know that, you know, the whole idea of a uh, higher chance of not getting memory tumors, the advantage of that may not be there anymore. Okay, it's more for pyometra. You do not want a pyometra. Okay, so the question regarding incidence of urinary incontinence spaying before or after the first season. So sometimes people say that, okay, you spay before the first season, there's a higher chance of 
urinary incontinence, uh, various papers have sort of shown that isn't really a significant uh, statistics to show that there's any difference. So we shouldn't be using urinary, urinary incontinence uh, before first season as a reason to choose really. What is true is that when you spay, you will have a higher chance of getting urinary incontinence in the first place. Okay, um, and that is that is just, like I said, it's just anatomy of it, the hormonal, um, uh, lack of hormones, so to speak. And the question would be, what would you prefer, um, without something horrible, it's to manage urinary incontinence, which is fairly straightforward to manage, is a medication, unfortunately, yes, it is for life, but nonetheless, it is a medication that can be done, or to risk a pyometra, or to risk a uh, memory tumor. Okay, and an even more horrible question to ask if you have a large breed dog or a rot violet is you have to pick a cancer. Do you prefer bone cancer or memory tumors? So, you know, so it is, there's no right or wrong to this really. Both answers are right as long as you understand exactly why you're doing what you're doing and what is being advised and this is what they mean by, you know, there's no right answer to this. And, uh, and, and even for, I, I, I know of a vet who actually keeps her bitch entire because she enjoys the difference in behavior during the season. <laughs> and she's prepared to spay it when she gets a pyometra, but there we go, that's her own take on it. And, um, you know, to each their own choices, we're just making sure you make an informed choice rather than just listening blindly to whatever, whoever tells you whatever really. Hey, so in summary, I believe that, you know, cat neutering, fairly straightforward. Okay, you're either going to breed from the cat, you, you're going to breed, okay, keep it entire, and breed from it, male or female. Then after that, get them neutered anyway, because the, the downside is so little, uh, whereas the upside is quite a lot. Considerations for dog castrate does include behavior and medical aspects. Okay, whether you should do it or not, and when you should do it, it does involve that. Consideration for bitch space seems to be the most contentious. So multiple factors, pros and cons will need to be considered. And like I said, there's no right or wrong to this. It's just making an informed decision to know exactly what, because literally it's quite interesting. I was uh, seeing some comments on Facebook for this particular topic that I'm talking about. And uh, one says that I'm a dog breeder. They shouldn't be spayed because it does affect everything. And you know, they should be kept entire and nature is, will let nature take its course. And almost immediately the next comment is, I'm a dog breeder. They should all be spayed. There are too many unwanted dogs around. <laughs> so it's like, wow, okay. So this is coming from the same group of people, dog breeders. And even then they have very, very conflicting um, thoughts and opinions about it. And they're like, there are too many bitches around. There's too many dogs around. They all should be castrated, spayed, unless you want it to be bred. Uh, unless you want it to be bred. So I'm like, that's interesting. And like, they're both probably right, but you can see that it doesn't just, it's not a vet thing or a dog breeder thing. It's, it's a personal thing and what you do with your own dog, uh, as long as you, is, you know, it's an informed decision. That's the key thing to go for really. So discussion with your vet is highly advised to make an informed decision. So regardless of what you choose, have a chat with the vet, let them understand what your rationale behind, have their point of view, listen to them, what do they feel, what do they think? And um, like I said, there really isn't a right or wrong to this. Okay, um, it's just an opinion in the end, even though it is a bad and same for me, it's just my opinion in the end. So don't take my word as gospel, it is not. I'm only a vet. <laughs> so yeah, and um, so that's that really. So at this point of time, I'm happy to take any questions at all. Feel free to turn your speaker off and ask. There's only the three of us over here. So, yeah. Now, I just wanted to ask something. In my experience, I have, um, I have actually three dogs. Uh, uh, and one is a female. She's been uh, spayed many, many years ago. And then I've got two entire males. Mm. But one of them, uh, he's three and a half. And last year, he was chemically castrated because mm. I was getting the other puppy. And I thought, although um, I had this kind of cultural thing about castrating a dog and had no, no problem about spaying a female, but I, was, I felt <laughs> a, bit, <laughs> a bit funny about the dogs. But no, he, he's never had any issues, behavioral issues. Mm. Uh, and he's a very diplomatic dog. And of course, he's he, he like yeah, into scraps. But I think he, he's been always 
you know, good to manage it. But mm. because I get the new mail coming in, so I thought I was a bit, you know, mm. worried. So I tried the chemical castration and I'd done it a year ago and, and still, it's still not coming back. <laughs> uh, I mean, okay. it, it was before, it was probably December last year. And okay. I, have, I have noticed at some point in the year, his skin has become very, very dark in the ears and abdomen. I don't know if it's something that you've seen. Yeah, uh, potentially. Hormonal changes can certainly affect the skin in various ways. And yes, some dogs and now, now he's got pinker again. So I thought maybe he's going back to normal. Um, maybe. And, yeah, do, you, do you remember the implant that you gave? Uh, was it the, because there are two sizes. One, mm, is, one year, one year. It's a one year one, yeah? Yeah, I, I actually so, thought I was going to do the six months, but I think there was a misunderstanding with the vet. Right. And when I came back to pick him up, they said, well, we've done the one year. I said, okay. 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 <laughs> so when was this done again? One year ago? So that was uh, before uh, mid-December last year. Okay. And his testicles, I don't know. I, I, I mean, they obviously shrunk a lot. Yeah. I think they're still very, very small. A year... Okay. You know, more than a year now. Yeah. And well, I was told that, you know, maybe three months into yeah. past December, it would kind of, you know, start to change. But I haven't noticed anything. Exactly. No, that's fine. I mean, so December, you're talking about, to be more specific, is December 2018, yeah? Uh, yes, 2018, yeah. Sorry, 2018 or 2019? Sorry. Uh, now we're, no, 2000 and, so now we're in 2021. So 2019. Yep. Yep. Okay. So basically, yeah. the, for if it's one year, it will last to December 2020, which is just last month. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, so it's, it's normal it's to... Way too early to tell. Yeah. I ah, mean, okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's, like I said, one year is one year plus minus a few months. So it's mm -hmm. very different from dog to dog, really. But yes. I, will be, I wouldn't be surprised if you told me that it was done like two years ago. And then it would be surprising. Month, then I'll be like, okay. Yeah. That's a bit long. Yeah. But there's only literally been a year, so yeah. I wouldn't be. That's fine. Yeah. I, wouldn't I have be definitely fresh. also noticed a, a hair um, coat change. Yep. Uh, in the legs, it become a little bit fluffier in some areas. Yep. Uh, so, you know, I don't know, it'd probably be the same if I then go for the proper castration. And I'm waiting, I'm thinking to wait when uh, the, the, the younger one is now one. Yes. So maybe when they're both 18 months, because they say that maybe with golden retrievers, you should wait until they're 18 months. So maybe send them both. <laughs> Although, oh, send them both for castration or to... No, no, for castration. Because I, I was told that the chemical castration, the vet is not happy to do it uh, forever. So uh, she says, well, if you, you may as well castrate, which I can understand. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it yeah. was... Yeah. Yeah. But, so, so, yeah. So, um, I mean... That's, that's an interesting way that what you have done and it may or may not have helped. It's really, really hard to say, but mm. nonetheless, you know, uh, it seems to have worked for in your particular case, which is good. Yeah. Uh, and I would certainly sort of agree that instead of using yearly implants, you mm. might as well just castrate it because not only mm. it is cheaper cost-wise <laughs> yeah. um, yeah. to get a castration done, uh, but unless you've got a specific reason to say that, okay, I want to have this dog chemically, uh, chemically castrated for the first four years of the life, mm. until I start breeding at five years, then maybe. Uh, yeah. But there's no real good reason behind it, really. So Yeah, yeah. Just... I mean, both of them, I, uh, the, the only reason, to be honest, why I want to castrate them, or I'm thinking of castrating them, is because... Uh, behaviorally, they are completely fine. You know, they, they, the only issues I have, they are very prey driven. So, uh, you know, but it's nothing to do with castration. I don't think I would yeah. change that with castration. No, um, not change. But yeah. it's, it's unfortunate because the, 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 in, I live in London and uh, some people, when their bitches are on heat, they just go for a walk. Yeah. And that means I will lose my dogs. They, they will go under a car. They, you know, the same thing as a cat, basically. Yeah. I will, yeah, yeah. I will sort of endanger their life and unfortunately i haven't got the choice no because no. uh the, the people with the females still think that they can go around but i have to oh, you know crazy man. i know yeah <laughs> man no I, I i totally sympathize that, yeah. that is just crazy because they just drive any entire dogs mad yes i mean and, i uh, i have seen it happening once and th there is no uh, training no. <laughs> there is absolutely no way you can stop no. a dog <laughs> no it's it's almost it's almost dangerous <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> to get, get fingers bitten off so yeah so i mean if you are happy with 
uh, what I find fascinating, Martina, is uh, how you're like, yeah, let's get a bitch spade, but the guys know. No, no, no. I know, that is me, <laughs> you, you know. I said, usually it's thing. the guys that do that. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I, I just, I think it's because not being a vet, you know, you, you just think, oh, the female, you don't see anything changed, you know, but with the dog, you, you know, a part of the yeah. body, you, yeah. you yeah. see it's chopped yeah. off. <laughs> Very interesting. Um, I mean, have you considered, without sounding random, um, not castrating them at all? I would love to not to. Uh, it's just more, my fear is literally if I, you know, I go for a walk and they smell a, a bitch in season. I, have, I, mean, I know they are gone. Yeah, so certainly castration would. Yeah, I, I would. That with a sexual drive. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, and actually, I, I sometimes think, oh, you know, I wonder if I ever wanted to breed from them. Would, if I castration, would I be able to keep <laughs> to freeze the sperm? <laughs> you laugh, but there is actually facilities like that. <laughs> really. <laughs> yes, they, they can uh, they can keep them in cryo, so cry, cry, cryo preparation. And uh, okay. it's for that particular thing. It's 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 not it's it's fairly new, but it's not uncommon at all. Okay. <laughs> yeah, and uh, some some I even asked whether they can do a vasectomy, so they can still keep the sperm. Oh, wow. <laughs> it's so much more f- f- uh, more straightforward to castrate. But there we go. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I I think I, in the end, I think just to be more worried about their life, and and the other concern actually. Uh, in London, there's um, there's a lot of uh, talk about uh, theft, uh, dog theft, gone up a big way. I don't know if it's the same in the country. No, in the whole country, yes. Yes, and I'm worried that if a dog is entire, it's more under more um, risk of being uh, stolen. Hard to say. Pro- probably d- depends on the market. Who are yeah. they selling them to? Yeah, yeah. If they're yeah. selling them as pets, maybe not so much. They're selling them to breeders, and yeah. Yes, yeah. I, I thought I thought that maybe the idea. I don't know why people would steal dogs. I thought maybe because they want to breed, because everybody's paying crazy money to have puppies. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, yeah. they're fueling the pets. whole thing. Yeah, there's a crazy market also there, so you gotta be mm. careful. Yes. Uh, good, good question. Thank you for that, Martina. <laughs> Um, I have a, a question then. Please. Is it uh, is it safer maybe like in terms of recovery for the dog if you just perform an overectomy and not like take everything out? Okay, so uh, very good question. So basically, overectomy, like I said, is to remove ovaries only. Okay, over his strength is to remove the uterus. So what they've found is that when you say recovery, you're talking about anesthetic recovery or just in general? Yeah. After that? No, in general, everything. Okay, yeah. 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 So the recovery itself, it's uh, fairly straightforward, just like any other anesthetic recovery. So it's not better or worse. Uh, arguably, it's less painful because you're not pulling out and breaking ligaments. So uh, the, the, like I said, you don't need any extra pain relief. So that, that itself is fairly straightforward. But in future, what happens is that it's quite interesting because uh, there is also the talk of a stump pile. So, so a stump pile happens when a dog has been spayed, but the stump, the cervix, still mm. actually develop pyometra. Okay, I'll address that in a few different ways. So the first one is that when we, what we found is that when we remove the ovaries, if you were to go back into the same bitch six months later, mm. the entire uterus would have shrunk down to two little mm. fibrous tissue. Mm-hmm. Without the influence of the hormones from the ovaries, the whole function of the womb, the, 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 sort of the uterus, just shrinks down to two fibrous tissue. So it becomes too useless, pointless, not pointless, but you know, uh, just uh, irrelevant tissues over there that doesn't mm-hmm. cause any problems whatsoever. So in that respect, no, overectomy does not cause any issues long-term wise to the womb itself because it just mm-hmm. shrinks down without influence mm-hmm. on the hormones. Stampio, interestingly, uh, because there's also another a criticism to say that if you just remove the ovaries, we used to get stampio because you're leaving the hysterectomy, behind, uh, you're leaving the womb behind. And what they found is stampio is that when stampio happens, invariably they've always left some form of ovaries in the body. The spay yeah. wasn't complete. Okay. Okay, so that's why stampio occur rather than okay. because the stump was there. So you actually uh, remove okay. the ovaries completely, there shouldn't be any risk of stampio or any issues with the womb or things like that. And stump okay. usually happen when there's a retained uh, retain ovarian tissue or, or ovarian remnant, so, uh, so to speak. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So that can't happen if you, if you um, what was the other one called? Overhysterectomy or something. Yeah, so, so that can't happen if you do that one. That's safer then. For stump So Yeah. 
Yeah. Yes, that can still happen. If the surgeon, oh, that can still left, happen. Oh, okay. if the surgeon left the ovary behind, uh, okay. or a little bit of ovary, that can okay. still stimulate whatever cervix is left. Uh, okay. So, stump pile is not because they did an ovarectomy. Stump pile is because they left a bit of ovary uh, behind. Okay. So, if you're doing ovarectomy, you remove the entire two ovaries out, there shouldn't be any risk of stump pile at all. So, it's not mm. safer. And, uh, mm -hmm. and, and the interesting thing is, uh, what we know is in Europe, for the past 30 years, they've been doing ovarectomies as a form of neutering. Mm -hmm. It's only in UK that we do overhysterectomy. And it's been gone as far as to say that overhysterectomy over is, a, is a barbaric way of neutering mm -hmm. when overectomy would do. Mm -hmm. So it is okay. quite interesting. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, any other questions? Good, good question. If you perform a vasectomy instead of ca a castration, yeah. does that, I didn't, I wasn't quite clear, does that reduce the chance of prostate cancer or not? No. So, no. Okay. Uh, the vasectomy literally just means stopping the sperm from going to the penis. Okay. So, the whole influence of the prostate is still there, the whole okay. hormonal mm. buildup is still there, mm. the whole influence of the hormones on the prostate is still there. Okay. Sorry. Good question. Oh. Any other questions? No, can I can I can I go on? I just I won't uh, take up too much more time. No, 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 just with um, pyometra, is there a way of? Um, I'm just wondering because my dog is always lethargic after she's been on heat because she um, she has a chronic condition mm. and she gets um, the false pregnancy, so she's yes. lethargic. So is there another way of telling, like, if I thought she's extra lethargic, could the vet, like, do an ultrasound? Or is there another yes. way of... Yes. Yeah. So diagnosis for pyometra is uh, either classic owner history, few weeks, few months after the season, and it's dripping pus from the vagina. Okay, it's like, mm. I think any vet will pick up that as, as, as a pyometra. If there wasn't any pus coming out and the dog was lethargic. And that's also the pros and cons, uh, not, not pros and cons, but one of the frustrations of pyometra is that if your dog is entire, invariably, any single time your dog is ill for whatever reason, mm -hmm. your vet has to rule out pyometra. Uh, uh. For me, personally, is pyometra underproven otherwise? Because the point being is that pyometra can manifest in so many different ways, just being a little bit lethargic just breathing a little bit faster, not eating well, drinking a bit more than usual. Any of those signs can be pyometra. So that's why one, uh, is if your dog is, if your bitch is entire, don't be surprised every single time you bring your bitch to the vet to say that my dog is unwell. First thing they say that, let's rule out pyometra. Ultrasound scan, question mm -hmm. mark x-rays, question mark blood test. Okay, mm -hmm. so, and even uh, usually for me, first thing I go is ultrasound scan because it's more sensitive. Okay, I'm looking for fluid filled pus. There shouldn't be any mm -hmm. fluid inside there. Okay, uh, and even if I don't find it, I still cannot rule out pyometra. I can still say that it could be a brewing pyometra because if it's brewing, it may not have bags of pus for me to see on ultrasound. But I cannot rule out pyometra. So that is one of the more frustrating uh, things for both the vet and also the mm -hmm. pet owner because the pet owner keeps going, he's like, can you rule out pyometra? No, I can't. So is it? I'm not sure. It's not obvious, so to speak. And for me, it's like, until I rule out pyometra, there's no point treating anything else. <laughs> because if I were to go down other routes, come to your pyometra, you'll be looking very, very silly. To say, look, it's the entire bit. She just had a season. It's not well. Why do you not think of pyometra? <laughs> yeah. So, to speak. so that, 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 that is the, especially with yours, with false pregnancy and things like that. Um, there's, personally, I do not know of a specific paper. But if your season is always weird, potentially pyometra may be more common. Mm. You see what I mean? Yeah. So um, if I were you, and I'm not you because you're much prettier, <laughs> I would probably get the bitch state. <laughs> Especially if you get false pregnancies and things like that, there's always needing vet yeah. attention after every single season. Yeah. Yeah. Sense? She. She. Um. My vet didn't doesn't recommend it because she's so. Um. She's always ill. She has chronic stomach problems, and she's never well for longer than two days in a row. <laughs> so, That's really interesting. 
<laughs> so I mean, she he's... she doesn't recommend it and I don't want to put her through it because I'm worried she wouldn't survive the anesthetic. Right. Okay. Yeah. No, I can totally, I can totally, totally appreciate that. As long as you know, you you accept yeah. that every single time she's ill, when you go in to a vet, obviously if you go to a very very uh, a familiar vet who knows your dog very very well, okay, mm. then they're like, okay, that's probably not a pilot. That's probably that something some. But if not, fairly standard. Most vets, entire female, not well. Let's check for pyometra first. Yeah. Yeah. Because it is. If you miss that, as a vet, you look really, really silly. Yeah. yeah. I've done it once. That, that's why I know. It's like, oh, okay. but, the science, but the science didn't fit. <laughs> said, no, because that one came up for coughing. Oh. Exactly. So I'm like, why would I not even think of pyometra? Then after that, I'm like, oh, the, the science can be so varied. It's not well yeah. in general. It's a female entire bitch. Check the, check the womb. Exactly. So, you know, I, I know, I know. So don't be surprised if a vet says to rule out pyometra. Yeah. yeah. And Lennon, is, is your dog, the one I saw, is that a, a boy or a girl? That's a little girl. She's okay, uh, okay. one year old. We're going to spay her in a, in a few months' time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. She's uh, quite pretty. Yeah. yeah. Any other questions? Great questions. I'm, I'm okay. Thank you very much. No worries. Oh, I actually have just one more about an implant for females because wasn't there an implant for females, but it wasn't recommended then? Yeah, I think it's used completely off license. I suspect it's the same implant as a male one, but it's just. It's oh, really, oh, okay. Exactly. I, I have to go and double check the facts on that, but I know there's not one license. So, oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So, because to actually sustain a season is a whole different ball game it's, it's not like the after pill sort of thing yeah yeah okay. so no I, I i personally wouldn't i wouldn't know i've not used any chemical sterilization for females before have, have you done for the male have you done it for males the yeah. chemical? and yep. has there been some down uh, downsides or no nope. This one was just very, very short because uh, unfortunately the owner had a friend who is coming to stay with them. They had an entire female for the next few months. Mm. So they just wanted that, but they also wanted to breed from that dog. So they didn't want okay. to castrate it. So after that, the friend came and went and the dog continued breeding after that. Okay. And, and the breeding did work in the sense it wasn't yeah, affected yeah, yeah, by yeah. it. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Okay. No, they um they always they always has a lot of caution, you know, on the labor and things like that. But the reality mm. is that usually it's fairly straightforward. After the after the um implant has finished, then testosterone come back, then everything goes back yeah. normal. And would and would you uh also be obviously you know not forever, but if you say oh, I want to do it for uh, three years, would you say oh that's dangerous because I don't know for whatever reason or not? No, 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 no. Mm -hmm. I don't think there is a, a huge amount of long-term studies, uh, mm -hmm. but nonetheless, you know, I'm certainly sure it's been done and it's still mm -hmm. being done. So as long yeah. as everybody accepts the risk, uh, read the label. The, the, the mm -hmm. label tells you all the different side effects mm -hmm. uh, of that. So, yeah. Yeah, okay. Right, well, thank you very much. You're very welcome. So I just wanted to say next month is Valentine's Day. So we are having a little tribute <laughs> for that. If you're up for it, uh, feel free to join us. And this ties in quite closely with um, my book as well. So basically I've written a book published in August last year. It's for specifically for pet guardians on how to develop uh, the best relationship with the vet to get most out of him or her, so your pet wins. <laughs> and um, yeah, it's available on Amazon, Kindle, paperback, Audible. Yeah, so. Anyway, I've so. read it, Lennon. <laughs> yeah. I've, I've, I've read it. it. I, I've read, read it, it yeah. as well. <laughs> uh, any thoughts? I, I emailed you. You probably don't remember. <laughs> ah, I remember you now, Melina. <laughs> ah, yes, I do remember. I, I, I didn't get many emails. It was a very, very nice long email. Thank you very much for that. <laughs> <laughs> it was a very good book. <laughs> Thank you. And Martina, what do you think about it? I, no, no, I, I, um, I started, I haven't finished it yet. Oh, okay. So I, I've got it in my library among many, many books I, got to, I have to get through. <laughs> very <while> studying. good. <laughs> very good. Yeah. Thank you very much. Well, thank no, you thank very you. much. And, yes, and, uh, thank if you. If you have a chance, if you haven't done so already, please do leave a, leave, leave a review on Amazon. When, when yes, you can. we will. Thank you very much. Thank yeah. you and good night. Thank yeah, you. Thank Good you, Lennon. Bye. Happy New Year. And Happy bye -bye. New Year. Bye. bye. Happy New Year. Bye.